Hello and welcome to this low-level JavaScript 7400 subscriber special. In this episode, we're going to build a digital logic simulator together. You might be wondering why this arbitrary 7400 number. Well, if you've watched any of Ben Eater's videos, then you probably already know, but if you don't, the 7400 series, sometimes affectionately known as Jelly Bean Logic, is a set of integrated circuits that provided logic gates, registers, adders, and all sorts of other cool digital logic right there on a chip. And of course I mentioned Ben Eater because he's built an entire 8-bit computer on breadboards out of these chips. How can we make something in JavaScript that allows us to put the kinds of systems together that these chips allowed for? Let's start out with the logical functions themselves. Not is the simplest logic gate there is. If we take an argument that we say could be a single one or a zero, then we can use the tilde symbol to flip that bit. But in JavaScript, if we do bitwise operations, our numbers are always treated as 32-bit signed integers. We need to isolate the least significant bit by ending it with a one. The rest are more straightforward, and we can use their bitwise operations directly and get all of their inverses using our not function. But it's not enough just to have logic functions. We need a way to really describe a circuit, how the different gates are wired together. For that, we need to have a component array, and every item in this array will be an object with an ID. Every object will also have a type property, which will describe what kind of gate this is, or if it's another kind of component, how that changes state. They'll also have an array of inputs, and of course a state. And so in the end, what we'll be doing is we'll be iterating through this array of components and updating their states. But it's also worth creating another representation of this same data, and that will be an object which references everything in the list by ID. We can create a function to do this called index by, where we take an array and a property to index, and then we reduce the array into an object. The key we use is whatever the key prop is of the item. Each iteration, we return our output object. This is important to do, since we're going to need to look up these components quite often. And since the inputs array of each component refers to other components by their ID, if we have many thousands of components, you don't want to iterate through the list every time you need to find one. Next, we need a function to evaluate the state of all the components at a given moment in time. We'll call that function evaluate, and it will take both the components list and the component lookup table. And what we need to do is actually quite simple. Essentially, we need to iterate through the components, and depending on the type, we need to compute the next state. For example, if we found an AND gate, we're going to take the two inputs and return their result. But before we do that, we actually have to check if either of those inputs is in what we call a floating state, represented by an X. Floating, or high impedance states, essentially signify that this part of the circuit is unconnected. If either input is in a floating state, then the output of this component will also be in a floating state. Otherwise, we just have to return running the AND function on our two inputs. And pretty much all logic gates are going to take this form, so we can extract this into a function called binary op, which takes a logic function and a component. That makes it easy to copy those conditions for every binary logic operation. And that really only leaves us with the not gate, which is not a binary operation, so we'll just write its logic in place. Now, the tricky thing here is that the really interesting stuff that you can make with logic gates, for example, D flip flops, they often have some kind of feedback where the output is fed back as an input. Any gates with feedback are not going to be able to propagate through the circuit if we only evaluate once. So the solution is that every step of the system we actually need to call evaluate multiple times to let any feedback that we have propagate all the way through. And as well as logic gates, we'll also include something called a controlled type. These are basically going to be values that we can manually change between steps, essentially acting as our external input into the system. We don't have anything to calculate with these components, but what we can do is escape the loop faster if we know that we have one. 
And it's probably worth noting that if you actually sorted this flat array of components so that components that have inputs with long feedback chains are placed later in the array, then you'd actually be able to optimize the processing quite a bit, essentially needing fewer calls to evaluate per step. So now that we can evaluate a single moment in time, we can actually start to write a real simulation. In the components list, we'll delete these examples and we'll add a controlled component called clock, which will periodically pulse high and low every step. And then another controlled component called A, which we'll use to make sure that the logic gates are working properly. And then we're gonna add one of each of the logic gates and their inputs will be both the clock and the A component. The simulation is gonna run for a certain number of steps. We're gonna place that into a variable called run for, and then we're gonna create a for loop. Every iteration, the clock will go from either low to high or high to low, and we can do that by running its current state through not. Then we need to evaluate our components, but as previously mentioned, we're going to do this a number of times. The actual number of times we'll put into a constant called evals per step. And for now, we'll just set it to five, although we might wanna crank this up if we're dealing with some quite complicated designs. So then we're gonna loop five times, calling evaluate with components and the component lookup table. To add some dynamics to this system, let's add an if statement that checks if iteration modulo five is zero which will basically be true every five iterations. And if it is, we can set the A component state to its inverse with not. So now we have a simulation, but how can we actually see the results? Well, for that, I've prepared an extra file called trace. The trace class lets us sample the component signals once per iteration. And at the end, we can produce a text representation of the waveforms. I'm not actually gonna go into the code right now, not because it's complicated or something, because it's actually just not really that relevant. You can check it out later for yourself on GitHub. Now we can create a new trace and then sample the components at the end of each iteration. After the simulation is complete, we can call get all traces and we can log out each one of those traces. When we run this file in the terminal, we see a bunch of lines going up and down. Let's just focus on the clock for now. It's basically a graph with two levels on the y-axis, zero and one, low and high. Each step is clearly visible on the x-axis as the clock transitions from a high state to a low state and back again. Likewise, in the A component, we can see that it's high for five steps, then it's low for five steps. It actually gets way more interesting when we start looking at the gates. The AND gate is high if both clock and A are high. So we get this pattern of three high pulses, then a five step gap in between. NAND is just the AND signal, but then flipped around using NOT. So what we see is two high pulses followed by one five step long high pulse. OR is high when the clock OR A is high. So what we see is a five step high period while A is high and then three high pulses for when the clock is high during A's low period. The interesting thing to note here is that the OR signal is actually exactly the same as the NAND signal, only phase shifted by five steps. And if you're curious about that sort of seemingly odd phenomenon, take a look into the Boolean Algebra Wikipedia article and check out all the associated mathematical laws with Boolean algebra. You'll of course find links for that below. Now, nor is the opposite of or, and you'll see that that is a phase shifted copy of the and signal. XOR, the exclusive or, is high when A is high, or the clock is high, but not when both are, forming this sort of two pulse and pause pattern in the signal. XNOR is of course the opposite, and finally the NOT signal is just the inverse of the clock. So now we have our logic gates, and we have a way to observe their behavior over time. We can go ahead and implement some of the cooler things that logic gates are actually famous for. For example, 
D-type flip-flops. This is the graphical representation of a D flip-flop shown here. It's essentially a one-bit memory cell. When the clock is high, the flip-flop latches the value on its input, D. When the clock is low, it holds on to that value that it had latched, even if the input changes, until the next high period of the clock. I'm not going to go really deep into how this works right now. I'm going to link to one of Ben's videos for that, and we're going to focus on implementation. So let's create a function that will create flip-flops for us. It's going to take a name, a clock, and a D in signal. The name here is just a sort of namespace for all of the signals that we'll create out of the internal gates. Clock and D in are the IDs of the signals that are the inputs to this system. We can return an array of all the gates and the primary output of the flip-flop, usually called Q, will be available to us under the name we gave .q. Let's keep our clock and A signal, remove all the example gates we had, and add in a spread out result of calling create DFF. During the simulation, let's change the state of A every three cycles instead of five. And finally, instead of logging all the traces, let's only log clock, A, and D flip-flop Q, the primary output. If we take a look at the waveform output, we see that the flip-flop Q signal latches the value of A and holds on to it even when A changes when the clock is low. One step later, it latches that low value of A as well. Now, flip-flops are really cool, but in their current state, they're not that useful to us because they can only hold data for a single clock cycle. But if we just modify this picture to add one more gate like this, with one of its inputs being an enable signal and the other being the clock, we can basically control when the clock is allowed to be high. And in essence, we control when this flip-flop is allowed to take on a new value. We can create another function for this, taking the same parameters as before, but now also with an enable. So first we're gonna need an extra AND gate. I'll put that into a variable called gated clock. And then we only need to return this component along with a D flip-flop where the clock signal is our gated clock. Then we can go to our components, add an enable signal, and change our call to create DFF to create DFFE. Now, because of the nature of this system and the fact that we're assigning zero as the default state for all gates, which in reality wouldn't really happen in a circuit, the flip-flop is always gonna start with an output of one. I think it's actually quite an interesting exercise to pause the video with this picture and try and work out why that is. But what we're gonna do now is we're gonna change the code that set the controlled signals so that on iteration zero, the enable signal is high. Since A will be low, we'll latch the value zero into the flip-flop on the zeroth iteration. Then on iteration one, we can set enable to low again, and at the same time, we'll set A to be high. On iteration seven, we can bring the enable signal to high again, and on nine, we'll bring both signals low. Finally, we'll add our E enable signal to the traces. When we run this simulation, we see that the clock and the enable are both high for the first step, while A is low, so the flip-flop will take the value zero. It holds that value even when A goes high for seven steps, because enable is low. When the clock goes high on the next step, the enable signal is also high, and the flip-flop latches the A signal, and then holds on to it even when A and enable go low one step later. What we've built is a one-bit controllable register, and all we have to do to turn this into a multi-bit register would be to have multiple flip-flops tied together on the same enable signal. We could package that up into a nice function that abstracts all the details away, and voila, we've made a modular component. And there are a ton of things like this that you can do with logic gates. I've already experimented in this system 
with full ripple adders, multiplexers, demultiplexers, as well as adding many more component types like tri-state buffers, bus lines, pull-up and pull-down resistors. In short, you can take this idea much, much further, to the point where you could actually implement some pretty interesting digital logic systems, including a full CPU. Now, I used to use a program called Logisim that was written in Java, and it was pretty great for experimenting and learning about digital logic, but it had a lot of bugs, and its weird sort of swing UI made using standard shortcuts uh, frustrating or even impossible, not to mention the fact that it would randomly crash with null pointer exceptions pretty regularly. So, if anyone out there is a front-end engineer and they're looking for a fun challenge, I would love to see something like Logisim made in JavaScript and running in the browser using either this logic engine or something even better. And if you end up doing that, please let me know in the comments. Thanks to all of you who've subscribed so far, and if you haven't, maybe you will after this video. Thank you so much to all the awesome patrons of Low Level JavaScript, don't forget to check out all the links for further watching and reading below, and I'll see you next time.